A little while ago, I made a Mandelbrot plotter inside P5.js using the standard pixels array, and it looks great, but it's really slow to run. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna fix this by using, you guessed it, a shader. If you don't know what the Mandelbrot set is, it's the set of complex numbers that don't diverge to infinity when iterated on with this formula here. If you wanna learn more about the Mandelbrot set, I will leave the link to the Wikipedia page in the description so you can read all about it. But the section we're most interested in is this one on computer drawings. So you can see here, it's got a formula that we can run for each pixel on the screen. And this will give us the number of iterations that this given location will take for the Mandelbrot set. And then based on how many iterations, we can color the screen accordingly. To visualize this, we're gonna be using P5.js, which is a really great creative coding library written in JavaScript that makes creating visual projects really easy. And when I first made this project inside P5.js, I was using the inbuilt pixels array that gives us access to all of the pixels on the screen and we can update this. So I was looping through every single pixel on the screen and running this exact code from the Wikipedia article. But as you can imagine, looping through every single pixel on the screen can take quite some time, especially if you're doing it at a higher resolution. So to come up with a better solution, we're gonna be using a shader. If you're unfamiliar with shaders or setting up shaders inside P5.js, I would recommend you watch this video here that I've made all about setting that up. But essentially a shader is a program that we can run on the GPU as opposed to the CPU. And the most common sort is the fragment shader, which gets run for every single pixel on the screen, which is exactly what we want. The reason this is advantageous over running the code on the CPU is the GPU will run a whole bunch of pixels all at the same time, making it much faster for this sort of thing. We're gonna start off looking at the fragment shader because this is where the actual Mandelbrot code is written, but there is some setup to do in JavaScript as well as being able to click around and drag and zoom in on the Mandelbrot set. So make sure you stick around for that. So we've got the position that comes from the vertex shader and this is just the position of the pixel on the screen and this is in a zero to one range. I'm also passing in a minimum and a maximum X and Y coordinate and this is the sort of bounds of the rectangle that we wanna view the Mandelbrot set in and this will come into play a bit later when we're dragging the screen around. I've also got a constant here, which is the number of max iterations and I've got it set to a thousand because obviously we don't actually wanna iterate to infinity. Next up, I've got an iterate Mandelbrot function and this takes in a coordinate and it looks very similar to the code that you'll have seen on the Wikipedia page at the computer drawing section. And this is because I pretty much just translated it into the shader. So I won't go into too much detail because you can read all about this in the Wikipedia page. Essentially, we iterate over this function up to the maximum number of iterations. But if we've hit the exit condition before that, then we return the number of iterations we've done divided by the max iterations. And if we get all the way up to the max iterations, we're returning one. So this function returns a value in the range of zero to one. Then we come to the main function for our fragment shader. I'm setting an X and a Y variable here. And these are the seed locations for the iterate Mandelbrot function. The position value that we get in for the fragment shader is in the range zero to one. So we're just using that value to lerp in between the minimum and the maximum for both the X and the Y coordinate. There are inbuilt lerp functions in GLSL, but for some reason they were being a bit dodgy for me, so I've decided to do it manually instead. We then call the iterate Mandelbrot function, passing in the X and Y values that we just iterated, and we store the result of this in a variable called I. And if you recall, this is in the range zero to one, which makes it very easy to output as a color because that's also in the range zero to one. And so for the moment, we're just directly visualizing that I value as a grayscale between zero and one in the output color. Moving on to the vertex shader, like all my other tutorials, this is a very bare bones vertex shader and we're essentially just using it as a gateway into the fragment shader. The main thing I wanna point out is that the position variable here has to be the same name as the position variable in the fragment shader. You can also see I'm inverting the Y coordinate of the position and this is just a quirk with GLSL in P5.js. But there's really nothing fancy going on in this file. It's essentially just passing variables through to the fragment shader. And finally, we come to the JavaScript itself. Now this is where we're gonna be triggering the shader to actually run as well as handle things like dragging and zooming. At the top of the sketch, I've got a few things to find. So firstly, I've got a variable called Mandelbrot, which will hold our shader, as well as some values that will help us with the zooming and scrolling. If you remember in the fragment shader, we had a min and max for the X and Y coordinates that we wanted to see. Whereas here, we've actually got a center X as well as a side length. And this is all just to make zooming a lot easier because we just have to change the side length variable without having to worry about recalculating the bounds. And we can do that when we pass in the values into the fragment shader. I've also got a side length ratio, and this just helps to unsquish it if you've got a width that is different from your height, which I've got in this case. In the preload function, we use load shader to load in our fragment and vertex shader, and we store them in the Mandelbrot variable. 
Inside the setup function, I set the width and height of the canvas, as well as put it into WebGL mode, which we have to do to be able to use shaders. If you're using a high density display, you might have to set the pixel density to one to get this to work. For some reason, the shaders don't like it when there is a high pixel density, but if you know how to get around this, please let me know in the comments. Once we've set up the canvas, we can define the default region that we want to be looking at the Mandelbrot from. So I've set the center X to minus 0.7 and the center Y to zero, as well as giving it a side length of 2.4. And these values actually come from the Wikipedia article. I've just rounded them a little bit to make it nice and neat. And the last thing that we want to do is set the shader that we're using to be our Mandelbrot shader. Moving on to the draw function now, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to calculate all the dragging stuff. So I've got a function here called drag, which we'll look at in a sec, which will handle updating the center X and Y location when we've moved the mouse. And then we're gonna use the center X and Y, as well as the side length and side length ratio to set our min and max variables inside our shader. And we do that using the set uniform function. Then we're drawing a rectangle on the screen and this will trigger our shader to actually run and display the Mandelbrot set. So lastly, we're gonna look at how we handle the dragging and the zooming. So I've got this drag function here, which you saw called in the draw function. Essentially, if the mouse is pressed, we look at the difference between the previous mouse location and the current mouse location. And this gives us a value in the range of zero to the width or height of the screen. But we need this relative to the side length of the viewport that we're currently viewing. So to get it in this range, we can divide by the width for the X axis or the height for the Y axis, and then multiply by the side length. And for the width, we also have to multiply by the side length ratio. And then we can add these values into the center X and Y variables. And this will keep the point that we click on directly under the mouse the whole time we drag. The zoom is incredibly simple. P5.js gives us a mouse wheel function and it takes in an event and this gets triggered every time the mouse wheel is scrolled. And we can look at the delta on the event and this tells us which direction the mouse has been scrolled in. So if we are zooming in, the delta will be less than zero and we can make the side length smaller. And if we're zooming out, the delta will be greater than zero and we can make the side length longer. And then lastly, we constrain the side length to make sure it doesn't go into crazy values. And this is our completed Mandelbrot viewer. You can see we can move the Mandelbrot set around by clicking and dragging, and you can zoom into all the little fine details on the Mandelbrot set in real time. And if we'd done this using the built-in pixel array like I originally did, it would be far too slow to make this enjoyable at all. One little quirk is that if you zoom in far enough, you can see that the pixels just break down. And this is because we're hitting the limit of the floating point accuracy. So we're using floats to store our position variables, but if we zoom in too far, the floats just can't handle the fine precision that we need. But you have to zoom in a fair old way before you hit this. But if you have any idea on how you could get around this, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Another thing to try would be to add some color. If we go back into the fragment shader, you can see we're directly using the output of the iterate Mandelbrot set in all three R, G and B channels, which means we get a grayscale image. But what you could do instead is use the output to interpolate between two different colors, giving us a nice gradient. So I've just defined two colors here called start color and end color, and these can be whatever colors you'd like. We can use the mix function and pass in the start and end color, as well as the output from the iterate Mandelbrot function, and this will produce a gradient for us. I am no good at choosing colors, so I'm sure all of you will be able to do a much better job of making this look a lot prettier, but I'm just getting the ball rolling on some ideas of how you could take this code and make it your own. And of course, there will be a link to the code in the description so you can have a look at this and play around with it yourself. While you watch me explore the little nooks and crannies of the Mandelbrot set, I would just like to say a massive thank you to Dan Schiffman from The Coding Train. If you haven't seen my last video, I made a water ripple effect for Dan Schiffman and he actually saw the video and commented on it and shared it as well, which absolutely made my day. So a big thank you to Dan. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing as well. I'll see you next time.